thanks for having me here again. Uh, my name is Andrew Amaro. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about um, securing your privacy and your data when you're traveling and crossing borders. Um, I'm a former member of the Canadian Armed Forces. I spent over a decade with this with CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. Um, I started off at HQ uh, working in the scientific and technical services uh, where I ran a few, established and ran a few national programs there, um, and then moved on to the regional uh, section where I ran a team uh, doing tech ops again uh, in counterterrorism and counterproliferation. Um, I actually do have a degree in engineering from University of Ottawa, so it's great to be back home. Uh, it's nice. Um, I'm currently the Chief Security Officer at Clavin. Uh, Clavin Group is based here in Ottawa, and we work with individuals and organizations from across the globe. We do uh, fancy bespoke solutions for security, and we provide services in security as well. Um, I also I also like to share a little bit more about myself personally. I'm a Capricorn. Favorite color is orange. I love going to the beach. No, but in reality, uh, I like to uh, skateboard, eat pizza, and Ninja Turtles all at the same time. That's what it is. Okay. So now, um, as I uh, already told you a little bit about myself, I wanted to um, also talk a little bit about logistics here um, and say that uh, I have to shift two things here. So give me one sec. Um, when we're talking about searches and rights and privacy and so on. We're going to touch a little bit about legal things. Um, I'm not a lawyer, as uh, you can tell from my introduction. Um, it's not legal advice, and I also don't advise you to uh, to do anything legal. Um, so you're going to take this as, uh, I hope, as, as advice and maybe kind of uh, make you think and look at things a little bit differently when you're traveling. Okay, so this is a bit of a, that's a little bit of the agenda or what's on the menu for today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my travels because I think it's important to, um, that was really strange, I'm under the speaker, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so talk a little bit about my travels and why travel is important, right, um, to me and to other people, um, to the economies and businesses. Um, my personal experiences at, at, at border and security, um, and then why digital searches are becoming more more common as well as i'm going to talk about four different individuals uh, and their roles and how their data could be different from each different role that they have and then some advice on on things that you can think about on planning your your travel and to protect your data and what are your risks and then i also brought some show and tell things so i'm going to show you some devices that you can purchase and take with you um, depending on how far you wanna go with the protection. So let's get started. Does anyone have any questions before we go? No? Okay. I do have some questions for you guys though. So I wanted to see if everyone's doing okay today. So I'm looking at everyone's face and everyone's smiling and happy. Good, all right. Um, has anyone recently traveled? Um, you know, post COVID things have changed a little bit. Has anyone recently traveled either by train, planes, trains, cars, or automobiles? Yes, a few. Okay. Um, have you noticed anything different when you're traveling through the airports? Uh, any of the procedures a little bit different when you're going through security? Yeah, okay. Um, when you're returning back as well, there's uh, the Arrive Can app has been kind of discontinued a little bit. They still give you some priority if you use it, but um, okay. When you do travel, um, do you take any precautions? Anyone here take any precautions when they're traveling uh, based on their privacy and things that they do? Do they, yes? Okay. Okay, good. Anyone else? All right. And um, I guess when we're talking about traveling, do the ones that have traveled recently, was it for work? Was it for personal, um, for business? Both, bit of both. Okay, good. All right. Does anyone have anything to hide like when they, when they travel? Always? Good. That's a good, good answer. 
everyone else that didn't say anything, maybe you do have something to hide. I don't know. All right. So why do I love traveling? Why does everyone love traveling? Um, I would say that I, I love traveling because it exposes me to, to different things, new foods, new languages. Um, sounds quite funny, but I say that I like traveling because when I arrive at the airport or I arrive somewhere new, the smells, the temperature, everything is just different. And the smells is just tied to your memory. Close your eyes and you remember that smell, you might go back to that place that you really liked. Um, I used to I used to go on on a lot of trips and I would take these as adventures, uh, kind of like the amazing race. And I'm dating myself quite a bit here. I don't even know if it's on on TV anymore, or if it's streamed anymore. But I used to always want to be the first getting through all the gates. I always wanted to do the things the fastest, speak to the to the local person to get, you know, the secret key to get into the certain place or get tickets for cheaper than all the other tourists. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And it was an idea of, you know, experiencing something new and getting new challenges and becoming a little bit uncomfortable as you're traveling. Um, I do like to walk tons. So when I do travel for business or, or pleasure, I do like to walk. I don't typically take taxi cabs or Ubers or Lyfts or anything like that. Um, I feel it's uh, it's out of your control. You don't know who's picking you up. You don't know what vehicle is picking you up, uh, who is talking to you, who's uh, listening to you, and so on. So public transportation is actually the best. And the best thing to me, um, just finding out a bit more about the city and the people, is um, early in the morning when everyone's going to work, dropping off their children, uh, shops are opening up, trucks are dropping things off. You get a really nice feel for everything and taking public trans uh, transportation and walking is uh, quite revealing. So I would also suggest that if you do walk, um, you know, be safe as to what routes you pick. But walking is probably the best way to go about things. Um, I never go on to tour buses with the tourists. It stinks like diesel and you never see anything. So I would suggest go on your own and uh, explore. Um, it's great to go to a country where you don't speak any of, you don't understand any of the language because it's like a great game of charades. You're trying to talk with your hands. You're drawing things on the, on a piece of paper. Um, anyways, it's fun. So that's me and my travels. Um, I do speak a couple of languages, so I do like going to places that I can use my base language to, uh, to explore. It's a lot of fun too, like I said, to, uh, try to mimic things. I didn't touch on the other thing too, um, the importance of business and traveling. Of course, it's like coming to this, this event here, you're gonna network a lot more. You get exposed to a lot of different ways of how different cultures do things. They'll have solutions for, different solutions for the similar problems that you have. So I, th I think it's really important and uh, to travel in the sense that you, that's the only way you're actually gonna get true exposure to other ways of doing things. And it's, uh, it's for growth, it's for economy and for business, it's great. Okay. Again, I'm gonna play on the, on the joke about the age here a little bit again, but um, at a very young age, I, I used to travel quite a bit when I was younger with my parents. Um, I still remember when flying was was fancy and uh, a really good experience, very positive. It's a long time ago. I still remember when um, we had smoking sections in the plane and we were protected by these super powerful polyester accordion folded curtains from each section. Um, and I think smokers really thought they were doing us a favor by not having us spend the money and smoke the cigarettes ourselves. Uh, they're providing us with the secondhand smoke. Um, I also was traveling across the pond quite a bit uh, to a country that had just recently or within the decade had converted from uh, an authoritarian regime to a democracy or a republic. And um, at a young age, I noticed going through border checkpoints and security um, and certain things and certain liberties that are taken uh, when you're going through um, some of the potential rights and 
things that happen because you are passing through those checkpoints. When um, I continued traveling and traveled for, for pleasure and for business, um, I used to want to take early flights all the time, uh, mostly because I want to make sure that I get to my destination. When there's daylight. I want to scope out the area. I want to be able to see how things operate. Um, I found out that um, I wasn't really a morning person uh, at a young age. And so I also found out that a individual, uh, a male, a young male between 20 to 35, uh, traveling on his own with a grumpy face, giving short answers to the border security or security in itself, um, just led to a lot more problems, lengthy questions and a lot more searching. So I was guaranteed to have a random search all the time. I stopped calling them random searches. I started calling them Andrew searches because everywhere I went and every time I traveled, I would get a random search. So this would happen at the gate. This would happen uh, sometimes in the terminal. And I started realizing about profiling. So I, you know, after speaking with a couple of colleagues that, that work at some of the, the borders, there's things to, to do with the certain age group, uh, the sex, and being able to, uh, or traveling early in the morning and kind of trying to be evasive. And I was hitting all of those. And it probably meant that I was doing some sort of uh, drug dealing or drug smuggling or something like that. So I found out that there are a lot of things that you don't even know that you're doing when you approach the border security that set off red flags and you're not even doing it on purpose. So things you control, things, things you can't control. So one thing I could control was I started you know, waking up earlier drinking more coffee, being a lot more social with the border and the security, giving them complete answers you know, to things and everything started getting better. And that was as simple as it was. Um, also, I don't know if this, yeah, still working. Okay. Um, the way you dress, the way you present yourself was also something. So this might not seem like it has anything to do with your data or your privacy, but I'll get there. The idea is that there is uh, the profile and you have to keep in mind anything that you do to make yourself stand out will lengthen the amount of time and the questioning that happens at border or at security or checkpoints. And I think the biggest goal here is to, um, to maintain your privacy and to get through as fast as you can is to minimize all of that. Yes. Nice meet you. So, so those are things that you need to consider. I think they're not things that you can really change, obviously, um, but they're things that you need to consider and your goal is to get through the border as fast as possible without raising any other, any other issues. So the risks that you might want to take will be different than someone else. But this also varies, the profiling varies depending on what country you're going into, right? Um, so you're, the risks that you're going to take are very different than, let's say, the risks I would take. So I know I'm going to talk a little bit about considering the risk factors, and um, my risk factors would be different than yours. The, but it could flip depending on which country you go to, and also how we present ourselves. So um, there's different ways of, of minimizing that or of reformulating it so that when you go through and you present yourself, you don't um, raise off other red flags. So regardless of who it is, everyone's gonna be profiled. The question is, are you going to go into a secondary check or someone gonna be looking at things like your, your devices and things like that? So, but I'll, yeah, if you do have a, another question um, when I get there, um, that'll be another important point there. Okay, so digital search at borders and checkpoints. Like I said, it's becoming a lot more common. The devices that can do this are available to hundreds and hundreds of countries. Hundreds of governments have them. Um, these devices are 
publicly available. They're typically uh, only sold to to military, law enforcement, and uh, and intelligence agencies. But there are some uh, private um, companies that are semi-government that also have access to them. This is why I always included borders, airports, and checkpoints. So checkpoints would be something a lot smaller, a lot less, you know, a lot less formal. Something that could be on the side of the road at a, you know, at a, a checkpoint down the street. Um, it could also be uh, things like entering buildings and facilities. Those could also be checkpoints. They're technically not borders, but they do the similar thing. If you want to come in, you're at the mercy of the search. The traditional uh, privacy and protections that you typically have, let's say in the U.S. for the Fourth Amendment, where it requires, uh, un it's a, there's a rule against um, unreasonable searches and seizures. That typically does not apply if you're going through the border. CBSA has policies as well. So you hear a lot about there's laws and policies as you're going through. CBSA has the right to do certain things based on their policies. Now, are you able to fight those things? Yes. Are you willing to um, to uh, to take the consequences that happen to it? Missing your flight, uh, having your device seized, probably not. So that's another thing to consider. So it might not be right what they're doing, but it is something they can do. And then it's up to you to kind of defend yourself. And there's a lot of repercussions for that. So this is why, as I'm going through, I'll try to give you some suggestions that help you um, help you manage that. Um, the other thing too, and this touches on, on your question earlier is your, your citizenship immigration status, um, all will take a factor as well. So a rule, let's say if I'm a citizen and someone has, is on immigration status, those two people are going to be treated completely different. Um, if someone is a non-citizen and they're going into another country, they're going to be treated completely different as well. So those are things that we're going to take into account. Okay, so this is for everyone in here because no one has anything to hide. Now, no one has anything to hide, but back in 2016, 2017, people going through the Turkish border were getting arrested for doing nothing, some, nothing aside from having an app one app that was illegal to have. It was an encrypted app. Or sorry, the app wasn't encrypted. It was an app for encrypted communication, um, which meant some people were using it because they were reporters and that's how the sources communicated. Um, they were maybe students that they liked the application. It's a new tech, why not? Some of those individuals that were arrested or held uh, didn't know that it was illegal at the time. So this was something that going through the device searches, they found out that they had this application and something happened. Now, other things that are happening right now, for example, uh, US, UK, and Canada have blocked or blocking uh, TikTok from, from uh, individuals that work with the government. Uh, UK is also looking at blocking uh, Signal. This is a messaging, messaging app purely because they cannot get access, and actually WhatsApp as well, they can't get access due to the encryption. So either they get access to it or they're saying no one can use it. They were also playing with the idea of, of making VPNs illegal as well. But anyways, so there's a lot of things that are occurring um, in the government side and countries that have like the different laws and rules and they might ban certain content and certain platforms. So I just wanted to go through a couple of these that are have been banned in the past or are currently banned. And it's a, it's a short list, I guess, but quite long, long, much longer than I thought when I looked up all of these, some of these I haven't heard of, but. So Wickerme, Mediafire, Briar, Beachat, um, Nanbox, Konian, IMO, Element, Second Line, Zangi, Trima, which I actually use uh, quite a bit, it's great. Cryptvisor, Enigma, and Safe Swiss. And then other platforms that are also blocked across the globe, and you know the typical ones. So Russia, China typically block a lot. They're the, the popular ones for blocking things. Middle East also blocks quite a lot of content. But one was really surprised was Jehovah's Witness, JW.org is blocked. Uh, Archive.org blocked. Google Cloud, Amazon Cloud, Reddit. It's like who doesn't like Reddit? Like come on. Um, 
anything like voice over IP, so messaging apps, WhatsApp, Skype, Snapchat, Face, uh, FaceTime, Telegram, YouTube, Instagram, Vimo. I was like, who's blocking Vimo? Okay. So there's quite a lot of things that are being blocked. And when you're traveling to these different countries, you have your phone or your devices full of these applications that are technically illegal. If they're going to go through your phone, and they might think that some of these applications are used for encrypted messaging or you're part of some sort of coup, they might investigate even further. Right. So these are some things to keep in mind purely because if you have all of this data on your phone might raise some flags and push them to go to the secondary search. Other things as you know, personal photos. So <clears throat> across the globe and across different countries, you have different laws on alcohol and drugs, um, also showing skin on, on, on pictures. Um, so when you're going through and you have your personal device, and you have these pictures that technically are illegal and they're showing you having fun, uh, potentially consuming alcohol or potentially consuming drugs, they can also get you in trouble. So keep conscious of that when you're traveling across the border. You're not in, you're not in that same place that you're actually safe anymore. And um, that's something to keep in mind. It's a kind of like a bit of a mind shift that you're taking your, kind, your entire history with you on the devices. There was uh, one thing that I, um, yes, oh, sure. So you mentioned about VPNs being made illegal. What about the uh, VPN that exists on our work phones? How would we yeah. go about mitigating that issue as a public service? I'm, so this I'm is curious like, to know this your is a conversation. This is something that came up uh, in the UK. So the UK government was, was talking about ma making this ban. Uh, purely because they didn't want to have anyone encrypting their communication, right? So yeah, there's there's that concern. Like VPN, you know, use of VPNs for remote access is something that's actually advised by a lot of cybersecurity professionals for companies that are controlling remote access in and out of their their network. So what would you do then? Um, would you make a special law? And then how do you going to distinguish between a professional? Um, VPN, for example, used for a company versus VPNs that are used by everyone else. The other, the other way to get around it is that people will get around that with other VPNs to purchase VPNs. So it's not going to stop anyone doing it. They're just going to make it even harder for, for the government to be able to look and have an awareness as, as to what's going on. So I think they, they're still thinking about it, just like they're still thinking about Signal and having discussions, what, what it is really is that they want, uh, the government wants some sort of backdoor access to certain things. So if anything that doesn't work with subpoenas or warrants, they want a way to be able to monitor it. A lot of the companies that are based on privacy, they just push back and say, no, we can't have it. So Signal's doing that and VPN companies are not based anywhere in, in Europe, anywhere like that is under the UK realm. So. They, uh, they just say, forget it. You know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna stop doing what we're doing. That's the purpose of, of giving people VPNs is so that you can't snoop. So, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And um, yeah, cause it, it's part, it's no longer just, uh, and we see this with a lot of tools too, a lot of applications. There's a lot of, there's a lot of bad people doing bad things with these applications, but there's a lot of really good reasons for, you know, everyone else doing business and maintaining privacy to use the same tools. You know, Signal. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, so same thing with, um, and I'll talk about the four individuals here now. Um, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but I want to talk about the business person, lawyer, doctor, reporter, international spy, or government official, independent traveler on vacation. So I'll let you guess who's who over there. But um, I, I I had something else written here, and I apologize, I, I skipped it because um, I got onto something else. But I wanted to bring this up. And the idea was, I had a fancy quote and stuff in here, but 
it was from the art of war and it was the idea of like not being on some on your own turf it's the idea of of pulling in your enemy and into your own turf you know bringing them to you and the idea of traveling i feel we have to keep that in mind because when you're when you're going to someone else's city um someone else's country you're no longer at home you're no longer in the safe domain that you typically use and you're used to things that would stand out to you because they're not part of your routine you'd be able to to spot them right away and you'd be able to act and react to them when you're traveling everything's new so things that should be red flags to you back home won't be when you're traveling so this is important too to keep in mind that you're on someone else's turf and this is could be government this could be law enforcement this could be scammers thieves everybody that has some sort of malicious intent that is potentially targeting you so keep that in mind so with that in mind i wanted to talk a bit about what each individual person here would have as data and then their responsibility towards safeguarding that data so when we're talking about a business person lawyer doctor this i hope represents let's say the professional world they handle a lot of sensitive information when it comes to to the doctor you have your health record when it comes to a lawyer you have the client confidentiality and client information they are um they need to ensure that there is a compliance between and a responsibility of them defending that data so they have to be able to keep that data safe when it comes to the business person i wanted to just highlight more of trade secrets and potentially new deals that gives them a competitive edge so that's also something that cannot be shared and needs to be protected the reporter i find in the state that we're in today um we have quite a lot of things going on in the world which we always kind of do i guess but reporters are are quite targeted more than they have been in the past they have a really tough job in trying to uncover certain things they need to keep their sources probably just as much as intelligence agencies need to keep their sources secret some of the things that they're uncovering is on the criminal world so they are even more at risk of retaliation so they also have a a responsibility to protect that data and be able to to communicate what they've found and transport that data across borders but defend it in a way that no one else sees it except for the people that need to see it when it comes to the government international spy government official for example our our friend here you know if you have you're working for the government and you're traveling with with sensitive files and so on on your device um what are you going to do you're going to bring all your stuff or maybe you just access it remotely so you don't actually have it on your device so that's some maybe a consideration what are you going to be doing when you're over there um but you could have things on there that you've downloaded onto the laptop that you might not know you forget and then the independent traveler um is you know i've been there and a lot of people have been here uh, been there as well it, you could touch on the surveillance and everyone always you know watching you or listening to what you're doing there's the tracking and so on i feel that the biggest risk is when you're traveling is the fact that some of your data gets exposed um going through the border they might even ask you some of them have started asking you for social media handles uh cloud assets business that you might run websites that you might run and that could lead to them putting you onto a file that now they're going to be observing your activity while you're on your trip and when you return home and for a long period of time where they're going to be doing some open source intelligence gathering and just monitoring of what you do so this is is it of a concern if you have nothing to hide maybe not but it means that now they have a window into what you've done while you're visiting they now have a window into what you're doing when you return back home some things to to keep in mind they also have identifiers they know which one what phone you have they know what laptop you have what other devices you have so four very different types of roles a lot of data to protect different responsibilities and and weight and consequences if it happens but all of them typically are are at risk um and they're all at risk essentially to be essentially to scam be scammed or attacked by local uh but potentially local um how do you call it malicious actors 
um, in thieves. So anyone can have their things stolen. Uh, they don't discriminate. Okay, I'm gonna stop just a second here. I wanna see if we can have an identification as to who's who here. Any reporters in the house? No? Anyone wants to be a reporter? No? Okay, all right. Um, any businessmen or ladies? No? Nobody? Yeah, nobody wants to admit anything? Good, all right, I like it. Okay, so um, no lawyers or doctors in the house, just in case if, I, if something happens to me? No, okay. Anyways, you're gonna be in different situations regardless of your role, mostly of the time is if you're traveling for work, it's a different scenario, different risks, different handling of your devices. If you're traveling for, for pleasure, completely different as well. So there's different risks and different responsibilities you have. That's really what I wanted to get across here. Yes. Um, uh, just a small thing when it comes to personal versus business. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the times people forget that even they're, if they're traveling on business, they're also traveling personal because they're bringing all of their personal devices. They're bringing all the their stuff there. So there are considerations when it comes to business, but you're also traveling with yourself, right? All the time, obviously. Mm -hmm. So people tend to forget that, oh yeah, I'm on business. These things don't apply to me, but because I'm protected under this company or whatever, but the company is trying to equip you in order for you to travel safely with company issued devices, protecting information from the company, right? Mm -hmm. And people tend to forget that that protection doesn't go into their personal stuff, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's your ultimately your responsibility when you travel to protect yourself and to take all the things that you you see all the tips and tricks that your company is providing you and applying them to your personal travel as well. Um, so I just wanted to, to make that, that, yeah, no, that, that link. That's a great point. Um, but I had a, a question regarding uh, monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, and forgive my, my technical ignorance there, um, but something that we don't necessarily hear about all that much, and I don't know if you can shed a light on it, is uh, geofencing mm -hmm. and how that applies to uh, posts on social media when it comes to uh, using locations and if those things can be um, uh, by using VPN or encryption, do those things go away or are they still accessible? So, so you're saying if, um, can I still see the posts or can I post? Yeah. Them? So if, 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 for example, somebody's monitoring a specific airport and um, I'm in the airport and I have right. a VPN and I'm still posting things on social media, right. are they able to tag those posts to my location if I'm using an encryption? Or you know, what are the ins and outs of um, different organizations, government or not, using geofencing on specific locations in order to monitor private information? Okay, all right. So, <clears throat> so on, on social media, for example, um, right now, if you go on Instagram and you're connecting from Canada, cover the the looking at posts and then i'll try to cover the other one um if you go on instagram uh, due to, to the new bill we can't see certain things that are outside of canada certain news media posts and so on if you use a vpn coming out of let's say the us you can see them all so that it doesn't stop you from that if you're at the airport and uh you're using a vpn and you do post something um a lot of the the social media Applications are really good at removing any metadata off of it, off of uh, whatever you're posting. So pictures, videos, and so on. Because anytime you take a picture, a lot of the cameras and devices have GPS and have a lot of other information as to what the device is. So like the EXIF data can be removed or most of them scrape it off. So unless you have any sort of landmarks behind you or you actually say something, I'm so-and-so is and I'm visiting this place, you technically wouldn't be able to tell that you were you were there. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about mindful, um, you know, social social media sharing as well. Um, my favorite story is of a of a young ransomware uh, pin pin king guy. Uh, he his girlfriend at the time posted something on social media, and Europol caught him within an hour. 
and his OPSEC or operational security was quite spectacular, but not his partner. And so social media sharing also puts you at risk. And a lot of the times, like even your uh, out of office replies, right? You've heard of being conscious as to what you, what you put on your out of office replies, because there's a lot of phishing scams that are based on, on the information you provide from your out of office, right? But uh, no, that was a good question, but I'm, hopefully I answered it. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna, this is, uh, this might touch a little bit of things you can control or can control, but um, these are things you need to consider before you head out. Um, and the first one that I have on the list here, again, is just your citizenship, residence, and immigration status. Uh, this could make it a very challenging or give you no option or give you lots of options in the point of, of challenging or complying with whatever requests are coming from the, the security. Your travel history. So let's say you've traveled all over the world or you've maybe traveled to countries that are potentially countries that are known for specific things. The length of time that you stay there, the frequency, all of that is your history. So that needs to be considered. The chances are that if you're on some potential list of traveling or visiting a country very often, there's gonna be red flags and you're gonna be asked some more, more information. So this is gonna engage them potentially in a, in a search, a secondary search. Law enforcement history, if you have been convicted or you um, are under investigation, this also will impact um, what searches and what things occur at the border. The other thing is uh, your patience with the border agents. So remember before I was talking about having more coffee and being more patient with going through security. I try to smile a lot more when I go through. I try to be in a better mood. I just breathe and say, let's just get through this. It's gonna be fantastic. And you just answer the questions and try to be as, um, as polite as possible. There's gonna be times that depending on your beliefs that you're gonna to wanna to push back a little bit. And uh, to be honest, uh, when I go th travel through the US, the 3D scanners, the full body scanners, I make a point of not going through them purely because there's a rule or a law or a policy that says that a pat down is just as good as a 3D scanner. And there is a, this cyber guru guy that I also follow. I talked about the billions of dollars that they spent on it. And they said, you spend all these billions of dollars and then all you need to do is a pat down, which is kind of funny. So what I try to do is I go through and I say, no, no, I want to opt out and go through the pat down. A lot, sometimes they don't have the staff to do it. Sometimes they don't wanna to touch you, which I understand. So it all depends on how much you push. You could say, no, no, I'm not going through the 3D scanner, but you have to be willing to suffer the consequences of maybe missing the flight, getting into an altercation and so on. So these are things to, to be considerate of and think um, when you're talking to the border guards that they could be having a bad day. So the, the, the thing to do is try to minimize any sort of escalation of anything. So, yes. Andrew, I just wanted to add to that. I think that's an excellent point is, is so much of it comes down to your demeanor and your deportment and things like that, regardless of any one of those, those four categories. I mean, I just think of people where usually it's because they're impatient or they're nervous or something and someone asks them their postal code and it's like, well, I don't have to tell you that. But you're, you're automatically putting yourself in a position with, the customs officer, let's say, or, or airport security, that that you're a bit of a problem, even though they haven't identified you one. And then there's also the of being too easy and almost obsequious, as though you were in a, in a witness box or something. And you'll, you'll hear people say things like, "Well, to be perfectly honest," and I mean those are still signal words, you know. Well, okay, if you didn't caveat every statement with "be perfectly honest," then when have you not been honest? And, and it's just bringing more attention. But the last point that Andrew mentioned, I think, is really good. It's it's be who you are. If you are traveling for business and let's say you're secondary for just some random reason and you're being questioned and on and maybe someone's curious about your devices is that, well, you run your own business or you're, you know, you're a person with some stature. There's going to be a point where you're going to say, hey, you know, what, what is this? You know, uh, enough's enough, so to speak, where that's kind of expected that you would do that. You're not going to be, you know, just going along passively for 30 minutes. Um to prove that you're 
not hiding anything. Exactly. No, thank you very much for that. I would travel. Well, I'm pretty loud. I'm good. <laughs> you guys can hear me, right? <laughs> okay. That I don't travel in But the last seven years, I But I noticed that I, and it was always more like a, a process of feeling. It wasn't really the only aspect So, Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yes. That when you're entering a new country that it's a privilege to enter and that you're it's not it's not a right to enter somebody else's country. Mm -hmm. So you have to come with humility and like appropriate right. deference to the person in front of you, even though you may be God knows what in life and the person is a border agent, you still have to treat them with the respect that they expect from you in order to get what you want, which is to get in. Um, I backpacked a lot when I was in my twenties and it wasn't always fun to get off the bus for the third time in 12 hours and unpack your entire backpack and show them every single thing that was inside it. And then get back on, pack all your stuff back and get back on the bus. But that is the nature of where you're traveling. And it's just something you have to learn to roll with and also give people the appropriate deference for, you know, mm -hmm. where you're traveling. That's great points. Thank you. Yeah, so so those are your, your personal risk factors. And then we have also... Um, the device and data risk factors and things to, to keep in mind. So how I'll try to go through a little bit faster here because of the time, but um, how sensitive is the data that you're carrying? Okay, that will also dictate what things you have to, to do based on that. Uh, what responsibility do you have? What compliance do you have to protect it if something were to occur? If your device gets seized or taken away, what do you lose? Do you have your data backed up? Do you know can you can you survive without the phone? Are there things that you you have stored in there that you need to conduct your business or contact your sources? Those are all things that you need to plan for. What data do you need to access when you're traveling? I think that is the most important thing. What is the minimum amount of data that you need to access when you're traveling? And make it almost nothing. If you don't have the access, if you're on vacation, I don't know if you're, you know, maybe watching videos and you know having fun. That's fine. You don't need to be accessing anything else um, work related if you're on vacation. Just go on vacation. But if you're working on business that you have specific files and things like that, try to make it as minimal as possible and protect it by encrypting it and doing those types of, of approaches. Um, also, infrastructure and access to internet. So that's something that could impact your plans. So if you don't have access to the internet, then you're going to be forced to put things onto your device. Maybe think of maybe mailing it snail mail or through your embassy. There's other ways of doing it, but you might want to just put it on your device. But the idea is, how am I going to connect when I get there? This is something to keep in mind. And then the device ownership. I think a uh, gentleman in the back mentioned it too, is if, if it's your work device, then there are different responsibilities that you're going to have to carry it across and different things that you're going to be able to tolerate or not. Your work's probably not going to tolerate that your device got seized. You might, but your work won't. So make sure to be speaking to your work, um, your work folks, and make sure that you have some guidance from them. And you also minimize the data that's on there. And I'm sure they'll tell you the same. A little bit of housekeeping. So before you leave, know who to call. I mean, if you're going to, to Athens, know where the embassy is. Uh, know where the local police station is. Um, know who to call over here. If you're going on business, know who you can contact over here, like a lawyer, for example. Um, some clients also provide the lawyer with passwords to encryption. If they do get challenged at the border, in order to get the password, you need to involve my lawyer, which is a it's a fun, fun thing to do. It can be expensive, but it does work as long as you have that planned and you have a reason to do it. 
plan your route from the airport to the hotel and then figure out when you're there. But from the airport to the hotel, many things can happen. This is a lot of times when you're traveling in different countries. The first time you're there, that's when things are going to happen. And a lot of the scammers and thieves are actually looking for people just off the bus or the airplane. So figure out how you need to pay for things. If you need local currency, get local currency. If they only take Bitcoin, get some Bitcoin. If they need just credit card, use the credit card. Things that you might not even think about. I just jump on the bus here. If you go to London, for example, use a credit card to tap into everything. But other places, actually, you need an application, which also impacts what type of device you're going to take with you or if you decide on what device you take. And again, minimize the amount of data that you need to take with you and decide as to what you need to take with you. I have a few more here. Sorry, I'm running a little late. I think the main two goals here are to protect your data and your privacy, as we know but then to make all the border crossings as simple as possible. And we already did some planning before we even went. We know what our risks are. And this happens in cybersecurity as well. We talk about threat modeling and, and knowing your risks and then applying a plan to cover those main priority risks. Then the other thing is preparing. So the aim of preparing is to have kind of a easy access to things so that you're not stuck somewhere where you don't have either access to communication, you're stranded, or you're not in a safe location, you want options. So you need to prepare. And then navigating through the border checkpoints before, during, and after, I'm hoping I have time to do that. And then while we're traveling, I'll also talk to you a little bit about, about this. So the preparing for, for travel here, I'll go through the list quite quickly. Update your devices. This is something we hear all the time. Patch, 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 update, update. This same thing for your devices when you're traveling. Um, if someone's going to try to uh, either attack your device or breach your device, they're going to take advantage of the vulnerabilities that are not patched. So make sure you do that. Make sure you back up your data, encrypt your, your, your data and your device. So the lock screen is one step. Then there's the data within. So there's two different ways of, of locking and encrypting, and there's quite a lot more there. Biometric keys is interesting. Some places don't respect the fact that biometric keys are actually considered a credential. They say that your face is public, your fingerprint is public. So in order to bypass that, use passwords, long ones. Don't attempt to hide data on your device. So if you're capable of going on your device and have different enclaves and different encrypted um, different uh, disks, go and potentially not try to hide it, get a completely new device or carry it in a different device. The idea with that is that if they do a forensic search on your device and they find that, that will be suspicious and they'll ask you more questions, which will lead them to ask you for the encryption uh, password or passphrase for that, for that volume. And it'll just increase, continue to escalate the situation. Stickers. Uh, Simple enough, they're really cheap and everyone gets them, gives them to you. I like to put stickers on here. It's a really easy way that if your device gets removed from your person and is taken into a room and you're waiting for a couple of hours, it's a pretty easy way to see if your device has been messed with, if they've added something to it, or if they've been snooping around, similar to the bags. If you noticed the bags have been touched, same thing with your device. So screws and things like that, you cover them all with stickers. Stickers are all ripped, you know something happened. You might want to throw the device out or get a new one or get someone to look at it a little bit closer. Okay. So before and at the border and the airports and checkpoints, airplane mode, turn off your phone. When you're traveling, don't do automatic connections. So this is on your phone, don't have, yes, no worries. Yeah. Thank well, you, when can you say one... it's my device and I'm not doing that? And consequences for all the different scenarios that, yeah. so, you know, in two minutes or less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's say in the US and Canada, you can always ask us to, if it's an order, if it's uh, a request, 
there's differences that you can play around. Um, and those can also help you later on, let's say the device gets seized and you do take it to court and there's like testimony, there's ways of answering that question um, or asking that question as well. Uh, most of the time is there should have been a lead up to, to that. There's like a reason for them to be asking for that. Uh, you can always ask what seems to be the issue. I'm just, I'm just curious as to why you want to look at it. I have no problem with you looking at it, but I just want to know as to how far you're going to look at it and what you're interested in, because I can help you provide that information without you having to look at my phone. So again, it's trying to be as, as polite as possible and helpful as possible. Um, they're trying to, they've, they've obviously had a red flag that made them do that. They don't do that for fun. It takes time. So it's more of, of trying to figure that out. If it gets any further and you feel that it's not the right thing to do, then there are certain ways of asking that question. Um, and that's something that you can find out talking to a lawyer for about five minutes as to how to ask that. As to say, is this an order? Am I, I'm, you could say things like, I'm allowing you, but under protest, I'm not consenting to it. Um, that type of thing, so. Yeah, and that's and that that's probably the easiest way. Um, but there's obviously concerns and you know reasons that you don't want people to look at at things. But it's, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, going back to Bitcoin, um, I wouldn't a lot more uh, usage of of cold storage. So these little tiny devices that take your Bitcoin off of like of live wallets and take them off of the exchanges and you can put them in cold storage as you're actually, your device is encrypted. Um, you can carry it around, it's like a wallet. Uh, you have your money in it and then you're able to, to do transactions. My suggestion is to not carry those over the, any borders. Um, put them into a live wallet before you go, certain amount of money that you need to make payments while you're away and then use them as you need. Consider the snail mail or just shipping it over to, to a PO box somewhere overseas if you need to access it. That's another way of doing it and know what you're carrying. So I usually carry quite a lot of like funny, funny devices. And I'm always asked what these are and what they're for. Um, just tell them, this is what it does. Uh, I use this for my business. Um, my clients like it because of this, this, this. Show them some pictures. They've learned something, they're happy, they move on. What you don't want to happen is it's secret. You can't look at it. I. <laughs> Talk from experience, um, that's that doesn't go well. And uh, supervisor supervisors are called, um, and um, a lot more authorities show up for no reason. Whereas, a, just be open and say, "This is what I use. This is my business. This is what I use it for," and so on. So, and and, and you need to know what you're carrying. Essentially, they're going to ask you why, and you say, oh, "I don't know what it does." That usually raises some flags. I don't like. Did you pack your own bags? After security, should something happen and they, they do ask you to go through your phone, you should document it all. Document the names, badge numbers, uh, what they did to each device, what passwords they entered, what social media accounts they looked at, what social media accounts and handles you shared. Was there any inspecting, uh, sorry, was there any, any tampering that went on with the devices? And if you need, contact your lawyer right away. Make sure that everything's documented and transferred over. And uh, that's the best way to do it. The other, the other reason too, is that let's say if you've provided credentials to get into certain accounts, you need to change those immediately, okay? You need to change them immediately. The other thing too is I recommend always a password manager, which typically reduces the chance of you reusing passwords. But let's say if you've reused that password somewhere else and you provided a credential to them, let's say to, uh, Let's say Facebook, you provide a Facebook password. That password you've reused somewhere else in another service that you haven't logged in in a long time, you don't remember. You change your password for Facebook, the authorities in diff different countries might go through all of the typical social media and different services and try, just like any sort of other um, cyber attacker, they might try those combination over different services to see if they can get in. So also that to keep in mind. Right, so make sure that almost anything you've touched, change all your passwords. This is why sometimes it's suggested to create new personas, create new accounts, 
simply for the use of that specific one trip and then toss everything out, which goes against some of the, the terms of use of a lot of the, the services. But it's better for your protection and it is con confusing, but um, that's one thing to keep in mind. Once you leave the airport or the country, and I said it before, they can put you on a list to keep looking at your, your data, like uh, your, for the open source intelligence, and they can keep monitoring you. It's not illegal. So they'll do it. So keep that in mind as well. Turning your uh, social media accounts to private is actually a good thing to do before you travel. Uh, because then if they do ask you for it, it'll be private. They can't see it. And the only people that have access to it are people that you have accepted before the trip. Um, you can do that temporarily. And then when you get back home, you can release it. But keeping in mind that they might also see it now. So device options for travel. Uh, I think gentleman in the back there talked about um, a temporary device or taking your, your main device. You might have to take both, you know, a work one and a temporary device or your main one with caution. I would, you know, Samsung phones are very inexpensive. They're pretty easy to set up. Buy one of those, bring it along with you. You access one or two things that you need and you're golden. It's probably the easiest thing to do. If anyone checks it, you have no issues. You can say, have a look, no problem. When it comes to uh, laptops, running um, a non-persistent OS. So you could take any laptop that has any operating system and you can install a non-persistent operating system on a USB key just like this and run it from that USB key, run your, your desktop, do all the things that you need to do change documents, send emails, watch videos. And once you unplug this, it's completely gone. So they can search all they want on the laptop, but everything you've done at that time is completely gone. So you can go to that extent as well. You can go to the extent of replacing the, the hard drive. Yes, sir. Yeah, your precautions you take. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so let's say if you're, if you're taking your SIM card with you, you mean, or? Yeah, so I'll talk a bit about uh, like electronic SIMs and then, and then so eSIMs and, and SIMs. Yeah, so that's another, another thing. If you take a temporary device and there's no SIM attached to it from here, when you jump onto the network over there, there's no risk or identifiers essentially saying as to where you came from, as to where that SIM card came from, you know, nationally, what network it was registered with, where it was possibly purchased. So any of those identifiers won't be there. So when you, you can either buy eSIMs online and then load it up through a QR code on the phone once you arrive, or you could buy it at a bookstore at the airport, something like that, and install it. That's usually the recommended way. Yes. Would they like find it suspicious if you had like, you know, a temporary device? Is there like a chance that that could actually make you more of a target? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Yes, so um, yes. Uh, to, to make a short, to give you a short answer. Um, so this is where it comes into the point where you consider your risks and you would consider things that you would need to use the phone, right? And as you're setting it up and things that you need to access the phone, you're gonna need, you're gonna need email, you're gonna need maybe the VPN, you're gonna need access to, to certain things. So you're gonna populate that maybe under a persona or maybe under your own name, whichever, which will make it less of a temporary device. Or make it it'll it'll make it look less of a of a throwaway device. It's a usable device. So to them to say that, oh, they don't have enough applications, or they have it's easier to say they don't have any applications, it's a suspicious versus they have one or two applications, maybe they just don't use the phone as much. So there's a little bit hard for them to distinguish, but it's a great point is to make it, you know, don't make it um, super obvious that you're trying to hide things, right? So that's a, a good point. Um, yeah, for the cameras as well, and I think it's uh, the EXIF data, so the uh, the GPS and things like that to disable all of that. Make sure to to put in new flashcards in the cameras. Make sure it's a fresh thing when you're actually going uh, on vacation. Uh, don't have anything in there that you might not want someone to see.
So now you have your devices and you've decided that you either want a temporary device or you want to carry your own device that's been cleansed, let's say. Um, how are you gonna connect when you get there? So there's a variety of different options. Um, you can, and before I even say that, getting a VPN device is, is something that, or sorry, VPN service is something you should have all the time and, and run through that. But in order to connect to the network locally, um, either a SIM or an eSIM. So the eSIM is nice because a lot of the providers overseas will allow you to buy it beforehand and you can load it up via a QR code or manually entering the code to it. You can also use all the devices just through Wi-Fi and not connect to any of the cellular networks. Connect through Wi-Fi, connect your VPN service and you're good. The issue with that is that you're gonna get spots where you're not connected, especially if you're traveling and walking across the city. Um, if all you have is Wi-Fi, there's uh, a couple of options that I carry around with my when I go somewhere. So we get to the hotel, you can plug this in, hardwire it, and this is actually a Wi-Fi access point. It's configured already with, with a VPN internally. So I can have all my devices connecting through my own access point through the hotel Wi-Fi, but it's encapsulated. You can also have the other option too, which is if you do have a SIM card, you're able to get it. SIM card, you can do something similar here. You put the SIM card in this. This is a Wi-Fi access point with a battery pack and you can carry this around in your pocket and your phone and your laptops can connect straight to this. But everything else, like your phone, is not connecting to the tower. So it's connecting to this. So all the data that's coming out or identifiers, the SIM card is to this, not your phone, which is nice to have. Other things you can purchase, these ones here is a, <clears throat> is a uh, decentralized VPN. This is like from uh, deeper networks. Um, the, these are clients and servers. And the idea with this is that you have multi-tunneling out so you can connect to multiple different places through different tunneling services versus the VPN, which has one single tunnel. Um, so there's a variety of different ways of protecting yourself that way. Okay, so now I'm finally getting to the generic advice for anyone traveling and hopefully a review of everything we've talked about already. Um, <clears throat> prepare for loss and theft. If you're traveling, you're gonna lose something. You're gonna forget it at the hotel room and you've just packed your bags and shuttled across on the train for three hours and then you forget that you just plugged something in and you forgot it there. Or someone's gonna pickpocket you and steal it. So. These are a variety of different things that you can do um, when you're traveling. Backup devices or know where you can purchase them. Is it a place where you can walk into a store and purchase devices without providing identification? Or is it a place that you need a passport, citizen card, DNA sample in order to get a phone? Is it something where you can buy um, <clears throat> a phone from a vending machine? Or is it a place that has no phones for sale? Or if they are, they're super expensive. So you might wanna bring one with you, right? Um, I already talked about the backup, the password lock and encryption. I talked about that. Apple tracking tags. They're great. They're super cheap. They work everywhere. Might work against you if used a lot. But if you're trying to make sure that your stuff doesn't get stolen and you want to track it, if it does get stolen on the bus, putting those into your laptop bag quickly, if you're going through some area that you're concerned, that also helps. If your device has been taken from you, and I was talking about if it's been taken out of your site at the border, for example, for a certain period of time, it's been compromised. For good or bad, if it's worth a lot more money after that, don't take it, get a new one. Also, if you find a device, we always, we always hear about people finding USB keys on the street and they go back into their office and they plug it in and see what it is. Simple social engineering attack. If you find a device that's really fancy, and for whatever reason, they haven't locked their screen. And it's probably like an iPhone, I don't know, 15, 16, whatever. It's fantastic. Don't take it. Put it in the mailbox. Don't take the phone. Don't take the laptop. Put it in the mailbox. If it's too good to be true, like anything else, don't touch it. Okay, scams. When you're traveling, you're probably targeted by a lot of people. Uh, people that know you're a tourist, people that know you're on vacation. Phishing attacks happen 
quite often when you're on vacation. You don't recognize, especially if you're taking a new phone, for example. Some of the networks actually send you SMSs to welcome you to the network and things like that, but you don't recognize those. Again, you're not on your turf. They're not similar text messages or whatever that you typically get. So you might be more inclined to click it. I don't know. So just be aware of that. Don't let other people use your devices. Someone comes to you and has their hands full of oil and says, my car just broke down. Can you come and help me? Or can I use your phone? Don't follow them and don't let them use your phone. Give them a couple of quarters to use the pay phone. Um, <clears throat> this is a lot of uh, simple ways that you can be targeted and you can be compromised. So it's kind of being aware of your surroundings. Again, the mindful of social media sharing is, is also very important. If you're constantly tagging us to where you're going, people will, will be able to profile and to start understanding as to where you're gonna go and where you've been. They can create a story that is plausible story that you might believe should they come and approach you in a situation, they might be able to social engineer you into something. So the less you share when you're traveling, a lot of times it's nice to take the pictures and share them when you're back home, <clears throat> not while you're going. And that reminds me of the, the ransomware uh, guy that got caught because they were constantly sharing and showing where they've been. Yes, that's a great point. Yeah. That's a good point. Yes. How to pay for things, it sounds like, you know, common sense, but yes, know how to pay for things. Simple as, simple as this, your credit card gets blocked for whatever reason. You have nothing to pay with. Um, consider bringing items of value for bartering. Watches, necklaces, sunglasses, blue jeans. I think that's a joke from an old movie, but um, you know, something that you can, you can trade. And bartering is actually accepted in a lot of places across the, across the globe still. And uh, you know, bringing cash, bringing a backup credit card, those are all very helpful. Keep your pass, uh, that's supposed to see to say passport. So, sorry. So keep your passport on yourself at all times and don't let it out of sight. A lot of places, especially Italy, at the hotels, they like to ask for your passport and they'll take it to some funny room, take photocopies and do that. Make their life simpler and say, no, no, I already photocopied them for you. You can verify it's the exact same thing. Give them a photocopy. This also helps that you can give it to your lawyer family member back home, a copy of all your identifications, just something happening, they need to go look for you. So. <clears throat> so we have juice and coffee in the back. Now we have juice jacking. Juice jacking is known as, um, as you have like these innocent looking connections, essentially. And uh, <clears throat> when you plug them in, it's actually a direct connection, especially if it's like a USB, maybe not through the power, but through the USB connection directly to your device, your laptop or your phone. So malicious actors will potentially alter these, to be able to implement malicious software onto your phone, pull data off your phone. So my advice is to bring battery banks, which I didn't bring today, but it looks very similar to this. Actually, you can use this as a battery bank too. This is the SIM one. Uh, bring your own uh, power cubes. And I know that it sounds silly. Why am I going to bring all of these things, like a whole bag of stuff for nothing? But bring your own adapters. And uh, don't forget that different countries have different electricity, right? So make sure you have these adapters. The last thing you want to do is not have a choice and have to plug your device into these unknowns. And it might seem out there, but it's not. So the FBI, uh, Europol, a bunch of different uh, law enforcement agencies have been warning everyone, travelers about this. And it's very, very common. Not because the airport that is supplying you this has done something wrong. It's, it's people that go afterwards and they alter that. So it's not the airport that's monitoring you. It's people that are trying to scam you um, or get onto your phone and get ident IDs. So on the buses in Europe, you'll have all these ports everywhere. It's so easy. Don't, don't plug in, just don't do that. Faraday bags, anyone know what Faraday bag is? It's, uh, it's a shielding bag that doesn't let the RF go through. These are very inexpensive. Um, 
and you can have them in here. It shields your phone completely from everything. So for tech techniques that bypass your airplane mode, this is perfect. It's encapsulated. No one can access it. Same thing if you have a sensitive meeting and you don't you want to make sure that nothing's recording you. Devices should be put in something like this. Sometimes you have clients that have bigger boxes, but that's something to do. What else? Uh, power cubes, USB keys, adapters for HDMI. Actually, mine today didn't work that well, so I had to plug in. Actually, I didn't plug in an unknown. Even, uh, even though I trust Andrew in the back, I said I'm not plugging in that stuff. So bring in your own gear and being prepared. And if you can't bring your own gear and you lose it, just splurge and buy something. Uh, buy a power adapter for 15 pounds, which you know back home it costs you five bucks. So just it's the cost of traveling, I guess. While at the hotel, Airbnb, airport, coffee shops, and transportations, we saw the connections on, on the buses. Things you could do at a hotel room to, again, this is layering and protecting access to your devices should you be in the hotel room. <clears throat> there are ways to get around the hotel safe and getting in, fine, but it's an extra layer. Use the safe, use the do not disturb sign. Bring a small little camera, for example, that you can record any activity that happens in your room. If you're leaving your devices in your room, that's important to know. There's also other ways to do it with tie wraps and stickers and evidence bags and things like that. But I think that will cover the majority of the use cases. Again, the VPN and using devices that I showed you before, um, creating your own access point, making sure you're encrypted. Those are all very important as you're, you're working uh, and even for your own personal life, that it's not being intercepted uh, and those public Wi-Fi's become less of an issue. Yeah, that's possible. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, that's totally possible, and they're they're definitely not a f no pun intended fail safe because they they um, there's a lot of ways to get through them, especially the electronic ones. The hotel has a master key, right? And you can get those electronic unlockers online from uh, from locksmiths. They're pretty easy to get in. So again, it's an extra layer. So I wouldn't recommend leaving your devices in in the room. But if you have to, these are some of the things that you can do to essentially limit it. It also makes the attacker have to think through all of the steps they need to do in order to get to the device. So the other thing to look for, and you know, it's creepy and all, but we all have to consider it, is when you're going to a hotel room, office space, or Airbnb, is to look for any sort of device or piece of furniture that's placed a little funny on a different angle or whatever, um, because <coughs> question already but it's how do you detect those devices if they may, may be very um innocuous or you know that that's quite stealthy right like it could be mm -hmm. in the screws it could be very small devices is there any um digital way of detecting those devices yeah so there there are quite a few different devices that you can use to detect those um the price range varies greatly you'll have maybe three or four devices that are sold on amazon that are fairly inexpensive and then you have other ones that are you know, tens of thousands of dollars um, that intelligence and, and law enforcement uses to detect them. But a lot of the times, um, if your eye is pretty good at, at capturing things that are seem out of place. So if you if you start looking for things like that, um, and if it looks funny, then, you know, carry around a, some masking tape and start, if you think something's there, just cover it up, even if it's not, I don't know. Uh, there's ways of, of doing that. There's other ways that there's uh, applications you can use on your phone. Um, that you can look for for signals and things like that. Um, there's fairly cheap ones um, for the audio, and there's things that you can use with the IR. You see it all the time. Some they could work. Um, sometimes they do work, but it all depends on on who your opponent is. To be honest. So again, it's more of uh, depending on your risks and who you are, 
and considering all that to the extent that your opponents would go. And then in the idea of like Airbnb, I think they're doing it more to, to, sort, to make sure that you don't break things and they know what you're doing. Um, but yeah, just keep that, keep that in mind. You can also take anything that let's say plants, stuffies or statues and whatever. You can tell I have kids because I say stuffies, but um, anything that's in the room, you can always take it and put it in the closet, put it all away. So there's, there are no gadgets there. Um, that's another way of doing it. And this is the key takeaways here. Um, hopefully, I, I know I kept people for a little bit longer than, than expected, but um, I, I think the main idea that I wanted you to uh, go away with is consider your own risk factors, your history, and uh, who you are, uh, how you operate, and then consider the risk factors of the data and the devices you use. Try to minimize your threat surface. And I, I know I didn't talk much about this, but the, the idea of threat surface is really, so what angle can, can opponents come at you, right? So if the least amount of data you have on your phone, the least amount of applications, the more updates you do, um, the less chance there is that there's an angle for an attacker to come at you. Minimize the data you bring, same thing. And know before you go, things like payments, cards, how to communicate, where you could buy SIM cards, and then bring your own gear if not buy it there. And uh, if there's any questions or? Just on that, I just want to add, um, sure. I think all that, that excellent um, tips, advice, and information, I always think the best, best approach really to avoid complications is really being honest. Being honest and being polite and deferential as was suggested. Full disclosure, I earlier this year, I had a teaching assignment in a foreign country. I was, I was teaching a, a police force. And so, and it's a nice place with sunshine, unlike here. And of course I got the debarkation card and I'm about to land and I see personal vacation. I'm thinking, ah, oh, there's a box I want to tick. And I'm used to being somewhat dishonest crossing borders, but oh, I ticked business. I was there on business. And sure enough, I had a lot of questions, but I did have a letter. I had a letter from the government for me. But but it's it's if you're if you're as honest as you can be, I mean, we all want to hide stuff. We all we all want to think we're smarter than the other person, but it just it just avoids, you know, being taken down some bunny hole and 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 all sorts of questions and things like that. And as mentioned again, being deferential and respectful, it goes a long way because that person's reading you in about five seconds and they're gonna decide whether uh you know, you're going to be a problem. So uh, questions, comments, suggestions, experiences. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny. The more you push back, the more they want to see things. And then the other way around, uh, I was traveling to Washington DC to visit a friend that was going through treatment there. And uh, he wanted me to buy him some McCain uh, pizza kits that come with the, the sauce and stuff. They don't have them in the US, I guess. And he, he was hungry for them. So I brought three or four of them. I put them in my carry on and uh, go through the border or through the check. And the guy's like, oh, we need to check your bag. He starts pulling it out. I'm like, oh, this is just pizza sauce and pizza. He pulls it out. It's got no label, silver canister. And I look at him like, yeah, you could toss it because I know what it looks like. And uh, he's like, well, how many how many uh, milligrams, milliliters? And I'm like, I have no idea. I'm like, no, no, just keep it. I'm like, it looks suspicious, but it's just tomato sauce, I swear, but you can keep it. He looks at me, he goes, no, no, go ahead. And I was like, so you let me bring three cylinders of whatever that are probably more than 100 mils onto the plane, <laughs> simply because I said I didn't want them. Like, I didn't care if you tossed them out, which was quite funny, right? Um, I wanted to show something simple as, as this, um, it's just like an iPhone cable, right? So this iPhone cable actually has a wireless, uh, adapter inside. That's why it's tagged and a key logger. So if you're traveling and someone gives you one of these, or you need something, this is why you should bring your own stuff. That's a simple, and it looks exactly like your regular cable. Exactly. 150 bucks. Not expensive. This isn't government made. This is purchased you know, on a website. The other thing too, 
there's like protection with things you can do if you don't want to carry around your own power bars and all that's jazz because it is heavy. Um, I hate the name of this, but there's a street name for this, which is the USB condom. But this is a malicious cable detector. And uh, essentially, you could plug in your USB key or USB cable here and then plug it in. And this will literally block and alert you if it's actually one of the extra connections is actually doing something. Because those chargers really, on the USB, there's like four connections on there. The chargers really only need two. If they're using more than the two, typically it's pulling, it's doing something that it shouldn't be doing. So this here would be something that can protect you from that. And this isn't very expensive, it's $25 or so. So you can do these things to you know, protect yourself and have backup plans. Let's say if you lose all of your devices and the only last resort that you have is to plug something in on the bus. Um, yeah, so there's some things to think about. Um, you know, you have a lot of data and things that carry a lot of history that maybe, you know, you've, you're a changed person and you don't do those types of things anymore. There's no reason why you should be held accountable for that anymore. So keep that in mind. So hopefully it was helpful and it has some tips and tricks for you that when you're traveling, you maybe think of your devices and when you're traveling with, you know, for work and your work gives you a bunch of guidelines to protect your work device, you can maybe port those those guidelines and advice to also your personal life as well. So I wanted to thank everyone for being here and staying for a little bit longer than, than expected, but appreciate that.